Okay. Welcome to the December 19th meeting of the SoCal Creek Water District. Let's do a roll call. Director Balboni. Present. Vice President Lather. Here. Director LeHue. Sorry, here. Here. <laughs> Director Christensen. Here. And President Jaffe. Here. All right, so there are no public hearings. Um, this is the opportunity for board members to remove any items from the consent agenda that they want to remove. Are there any items that anyone wants to remove? Not me. Okay. That brings us to the consent agenda. Uh, public comment. Oh, public comment. Thank you. On the consent agenda. First time. <laughs> so. I wonder who it is. It's a lot easier to remind people than to actually do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get there. It's on. There we go. Good evening. Um, my name is Becky Steinbrunner. I would like to comment on some of the consent agenda items. First of all, item 4.1, the minutes. I request that your board um, include a link to the community television video of those minutes of those, that meeting for which those draft minutes are um, given to you. That will help the members of the public to review what was actually said and to verify the minutes are accurate and to learn more about what happened. So I request that you include a link to the community television government on demand. Um, I have noticed that uh, the links to the meeting videos on your website are often quite uh, delayed in appearing, but you can get them the very next day or even the same day um, on community television. They do a great job. Item 4.3, the MOU with SEIU uh, 521. Um, I noticed that um, last time I had seen something in the uh, financial report about uh, in 2024 there would be a 5% increase in salary schedule. And after I finished speaking, it was declared that was misinformation. But I see it now in the MOU, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it says 2024 on page 23, a 5% increase in salary schedule. Um, I was quite amazed to read that your district pays people $1.50 a day to ride their bike to work. And uh, that's very nice, but it is totals up to $360 a year per person for the district to do that. And I wonder how that is reported in your financial business. Um, there is no water demand offset Sorry. accounting for Barry Swenson Builder in the Aptos okay. Village project. Was it at two minutes for? And, and that is uh, item 4.8. Okay, I can ask you okay. to. Okay, I did write your board about it and I would like a response, okay. please. Thank you, Becky. All right, yeah, let's, let's keep to the time limits, respect everybody's time at the meeting. All right, so now. I'll move so. approval of the uh, consent agenda. I'll second. And we can do a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay. That brings us to oral and written communications. So this is for members of the public first and then for the board to talk on matters of interest that are not on the agenda tonight. Is there an, are there any public comment? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I do note on the um, agenda materials in the separate, um, sorry, the communications links that uh, there is some very excellent communication from Mr. John Cole, and he is um, asking you to put in with your rate uh, materials a, f a simple protest um, mailer. I asked you to.
please pay attention to that. Regarding um, the, the way the meetings are run, I asked in an email to, uh, to Ms. Western whether uh, remote participants can speak. Are there remote participants? <laughs> it's not clear in your board pack, uh, agenda materials if remote participation is even uh, possible. It talks about written communication guidelines, but nothing about remote uh, participation. So I would like that made very clear. If there is none, then make that clear, because in these times when we're all still scrambling all over the place after COVID, some meetings are remote or hybrid, others are not, and it would help the public immensely if they could look at your materials and know what is possible. Um, I didn't receive a response from Ms. Western. I'm, I am not able to drive at night anymore, and I'm very grateful that a friend gave me a ride because otherwise I would not been able to, um, to be here or to um, pr present comment, I think. So please do that. And um, again, please put a link to the recordings uh, to the community television. I want to, in closing, um, recognize, um, well, there is one more thing about the, the agendas. I request that you put hyperlinks on the agenda to reports. This was actually requested by Director LeHue of Santa Cruz County LAFCO. And Mr. Serrano did it, and it is wonderful because uh, you can look at the agenda, you can click on the link and go right to the report or the item or whatever it is, and uh, you don't have to wade through pages and pages. And some people do not have the computer ability to download large files, so please consider that. Now, in closing, I want to just say something good. And um, I every time I go by the garden, out in front of your office, I think of, of Vi. And she really was a great person. And um, I miss her. And I'm glad that Garden is there to remember her. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Does staff want to reply to anything? No. All right. Anybody else? I just wanted to quickly report on the meetings that I attended. Is that OK? That is weird. That's perfect. Good. So um, on 12-12, I attended the Flood Control and Water Conservation Zone 5 meeting. It's part of the Board of Supervisors meeting. And um, we uh, passed the consent agenda, and we approved um, a rate study to go forward for, um, for a possible stormwater fee. And um, that's it. If anyone wanted to report on the um, MGA meeting on 12-14, that might be helpful, too, if anyone wants to do that. Anybody want to do that, or are there any other items from a, a director they want to? I, I, I actually just wanted to follow up on Becky's comments. I do think the easier we can make it to have links in the agenda for either reports or, you know, links to the um, actual video, I think that's a good idea. As far as MGA, um, you know, it was a... You know, it was a big agenda, you know, with with a lot of items. I'm not sure which one I'd want to focus on, but Carla, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I was actually, I was going to comment on, on the MGA, too, because uh, there was a big, uh, just the other day, and I had the article in my hands, and I left it at home on my rush out the door. But um, it was a, uh, an, an, a huge article investigation on water, and water uh, control of groundwater and the slow pace that uh, California had taken. But they did specifically commented on some MGAs uh, that uh, were not, are not as successful as our MGA. Was, you know, people are very respectful, civil. Um, it was one up in Northern California where they were trying to control some uh, farmers who had been overdrawing for decades, probably ever since they started regulating water. And, uh, in their, and the farmer's response was to sue everybody else. <laughs> and they were carrot farmers. And um, 
it just really uh, a contrast between what we experience here in the, you know this very a uh, cooperative uh, cooperative environment for the MGA compared to some other places in California is just and, remarkable. And we um, we're getting prepared to do actually already the five year periodic review of the of of how we're doing of the groundwater sustainability plan and and um, so that was you know we definitely made progress we also gave a word of thanks to rosemary menard for all her help on on the mga and you know since since i was on it from the very beginning um it really is has been a very cooperative group and and seems like it's going into the future well you know so i'm, I'm all I can remember right now. And dealing with some difficult issues still to come. We, we have our own. Metering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's one of the issues in this larger thing. I'll be happy to um, provide the link to that article. It was just a few days ago, but um, I don't remember. One other notable thing, I think, just to mention real briefly, is um, the seascape um, area chlorides are increasing in the monitoring wells there, uh, specifically SCA2 um, and SCA5. Um, and so that's being investigated, and that's news. Okay. President, President Jaffe, if I may make a comment <clears throat> regarding access to the um, agenda and stuff. Emma, can you comment on that? Sure. So if you go to the Agenda Center and click on the meeting date, it'll have the board packet. And if you hit the three bars on the side, it'll give you a bookmarks tab that'll link to each item and report in the board packet. And then regarding the videos and a meeting link, or a link in the minutes, we do have a link. It links to our agenda center. And that's because not all of the district's meetings are hosted on CTV's YouTube channel. Um, during Zoom, we hosted those and posted them to the website. Great. Sounds like you took care of it. Thank you. Perhaps you could. Um put a little a few sentences in where they where you see the agenda packages on what you just said on, on how we people who want to um, see more details and be more specific about items how to find them okay. all right any other comments from directors okay that brings us to reports district council um, thanks, President Jaffe. Uh, just a brief reminder, this is our last meeting of 2023, so um, you know all the legislation that was passed this year uh, in Sacramento will take effect January 1st, unless it was an urgency measure. Um, we've talked about some bills of note, um, you know, and we're still, you know, frankly, given the amount that that happens each legislative cycle, still processing everything, and if there's additional bills of, of note, we'll, we'll include those in future reports. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? All right. So that brings us to administrative business then. So the first item, 7.1, conditional and unconditional will serves. There are none. And that brings us to 7.2, uh, presentation and acceptance of annual comprehensive financial report for fiscal year 2022-2023 and appropriate uh, pro appropriate appropriate funds for the capital facilities reserve so that's you right Leslie that's me um, so I'm here this evening um, to introduce our auditor Jonathan Foster a partner with Davis Farr LLP out of Sacramento and he's going to go ahead and give you the highlights of the financial statement audit. I would like to go ahead and point out real quick because part of this is to appropriate funds for the capital facilities reserve. And our capital facilities reserve policy allows us to take um, any gain in unrestricted net position and allocate it to the capital facilities reserve if we, if we so choose. Uh, once again this year, there have been no unrestricted net gains in net positions, so we have no funds to allocate to the capital facilities reserve. That's just for information. So right now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Jonathan and I'll let him go ahead and share his presentation on the financial statements. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Leslie. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I'm just getting my voice back the last couple of days. Uh, as Leslie mentioned, my name is Jonathan Foster. I was the partner overseeing the engagement. Uh, I just want to thank the board for allowing me to present over Zoom. And I want to thank Leslie and Ryan um, for all their hard work and uh, putting up with all our questions during the audit. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and get the uh, presentation started. Um, are you okay if I stop the other screen sharing? Yes. Yes. It's a little hard to hear. Jonathan, I know your voice is hoarse. Can you speak just a little bit louder? We're having a hard time hearing. Sure. Can you hear me right now? Let me know if you, is my mic picking me up? We can hear you. It's just a little faint with the settings of the audio in the room. So if you could really project. Sure. Um, I will uh, uh, speak in a, try to speak in my booming voice. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Let me know if you can't see the slides. Uh, the first slide up is the presentation of the reports we issue as auditors. Uh, the first is labeled the opinion in the basic financial statements. Now this letter is within the financial statements that you uh, have received. And within that is our opinion. Um, we issued an unmodified opinion in the current year. Now what that means as, aud as auditors, we did not have to make any modifications to the opinion. So Jonathan? an unmodified opinion is actually the highest level you can receive from an auditor's opinion. Jonathan, Jonathan we're, we're just- uh, You're still on the first introductory uh, title screen. And it's, it's not in presentation mode. So we only we're seeing your future slides as well. Okay, let me, let me exit out. <laughs> so yeah, is it not in presentation mode? It is, but it's showing up on the other monitor, unfortunately. Okay. Me, Melanie, uh, there's a PDF of his slideshow on your computer if you wanted to present instead. We can, we can pull it up for you here, Jonathan, if that's easier. Oh, there it is. Oh, no. that there we go. Yeah, it should be the correct slide now. Um, just confirming you can see the reports issued on the screen currently. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. The first bullet point explain the unmodified opinion we issued as auditors, which is the highest level opinion that we can issue. Uh, the second bullet point describes an additional paragraph in this year's audit opinion. Similar to last year when we implemented GASB 87 leases, there's a new accounting standard that was required to be implemented in the current year, GASB 96, subscription-based information technology arrangements. So that's an additional paragraph in this year's audit opinion, which I'll speak further on uh, additional slides next. Secondly, is a report on internal control over financial reporting. If we had matters to report here over internal controls or compliance with laws and regulations, it would be noted within this letter. Uh, happy to note there were not any items to report uh, within this letter. Lastly, we issued a letter, which is uh, the summary of audit results. And within this letter, we just communicate the scope and timing of the audit and anything uh, relevant we had to report to the board. Uh, the audit letter issued this year was very standard in nature. So I'm gonna take some time and speak about some of the areas we spend time uh, during our audit. Uh, our team was out in the field in October. And during that time, we performed a walkthrough of internal controls with your staff at the district. Uh, we made sure the internal controls were operating effectively and you had proper segregation of duties. We spent a significant amount of time testing your capital assets. In addition to working with finance and tying out all your capital asset records to the financial statements, we also meet with individuals outside of finance and ensure the capital projects are appropriately reflected within the financial statements. The largest project we reviewed this year was the Pure, Pure Water Soquel Creek project. 
You'll see a new line item within your capital asset footnote as well. Now, this is due to the implementation of GASB 96. You'll notice a new line item titled subscription assets. And within that, there's a corresponding liability as well. So within this slide, you'll see capital assets um, that corresponds with the implementation of GASB 96 subitas. So offsetting the asset is a liability, which is further disclosed in note eight to the financial statements. Now, these are brand new disclosures for the current year across all government agencies um, um, for the state of California and for the country. Your pension and OPEB obligations, we obtained third party actuarial reports and made sure they're appropriately reported within your financial statements. And within the financial statement highlights, I'll speak a little bit about your pension liability. Lastly, you'll see increases in your long-term liabilities as well. And what we do as auditors, we also confirm externally with lenders, meaning we send them what's called confirmations. We do that electronically with your lenders and they reply directly back to us. So as auditors, we confirm externally outside of the district and make sure the amounts reported as long-term liabilities are actually true in fact. So I'll speak a little bit about your financial statement highlights. Overall, your total current assets were fairly consistent year over year. You'll notice, however, a large jump in your non-current assets, specifically over your capital assets. There was a large investment in capital assets as you'll see further in note four. Within note four, you can see all the activity invested specifically over construction and progress. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, your poor water soak project. Lastly, on the bottom of this, you'll see changes in deferrals. Now these deferrals are, uh, um, are reported directly from third party actual reports. So that your pension and OPEB reports are reported to, to the district, and these amounts get uh, get changed annually based on how they, uh, your third party actuaries report them. Can I stop you right there for a second? Sure. The numbers are very small in this, so if we're not able to, I don't think the audience is able to, to, to see all the details. So if there's some number that you want us to pay attention to, um, call it out. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So um, you probably can't see capital assets not being depreciated. Uh, in the prior year, that number was $93 million. In the current year, that jumped up to $149 million. Um, now, this is the money spent directly um, to your capital projects. Um, so it represents the investment the district has made in your capital activity. The next slide reflects your liabilities of the district. Now, your long-term liabilities, as noted, uh, jump significantly. Um, other long-term liabilities, you can see they jump from $26.5 million to uh, $57.6 million. Now, this is the, due to the drawdown of various uh, credit facilities that the district has available to them, and this money was used to fund capital projects. The second biggest jump I wanted to point out was your net pension liability. Now, in the prior year, you reported a net pension liability of approximately $2.7 million. This year, that jumped up to $7.8 million. Now, this is due to no fault to the district. What happens with reporting pension liabilities is they're reported a year behind. So CalPERS reports a measurement date as of fiscal year 22. Now, in fiscal year 22, CalPERS reported a net investment loss of 6.1%, which causes net pension liability to jump up to that $7.8 million you see. For fiscal year 23, which will be reflected subsequently in your financial statements for fiscal year 24, CalPERS has already presented a 5.8% gain on investments. So the expectation is that the net pension liability will drop again uh, in next year's financial statements. And the final line item is your deferrals, as, as I explained uh, in the slide previously. Um, these are not numbers that are calculated by the district, but in fact, by your third party actuaries. The next slide represents your operating activity for the year. Now operating activities were fairly consistent. Uh, operating revenues were fairly consistent from 2022 to two, 2023. Um, your operating revenues in the prior year were 25.4 million compared to 25.2 million in the current year. So they remain fairly consistent. Now on your operating expenses, you'll see a large difference from 22 to 23. And uh, fiscal year 22, you reported $3.9 million in general and administrative expenses. 
and the current year reported $6.8 million. Now, this does not necessarily mean that the district spent uh, almost $3 million in additional cash outflows. The prior year um, included some pension and OPEB adjustments of approximately $2.3 million. So when you add these back in, general administrative expenses are fairly consistent from year to year. And what happens is your OPEB and pension adjustments are reflected in this line item um, within. Your current year adjustment net of OPEB and pension expenses was only about $183,000. So when you look at that difference from year over year, that difference was mainly due to your pension and OPEB adjustments. This next slide shows your non-operating revenues and the changes year over year. Now you can see here that your interest expense increased from the prior year of approximately $1 million to $2.2 million in the current year. As I stated earlier, the drawdowns of credit um, resulted in increased expenses of the district. And our expectation is we can we'll continue to see this year over year until those uh, lines of credit are paid down. You also see interest earnings. In 2022, we only reported approximately $2,000 in earnings compared to the current year of $250,000. Uh, 2023 represented better market conditions for the district than in the prior year, which explains the positive inflow. So overall, your change in net position was approximately $30 million as compared to the prior year of $30, $35 million. Now the final slide displays the different categories of your net position. So as you can see in the prior year, your net position went from $118 million to $148 million. Now this may seem like a fairly large number. However, $134 million of this is your net investment in capital assets, which is non-liquid to the district. So this number is calculated by taking your total capital assets, subtracted by your outstanding capital debt payable, as, long as, as, long, um, as well as your subscription and lease liabilities. So $134 of this $148 million of net position is actually non-liquid to the district. So at this time, I'd like to open it up for any questions that the board may have. Okay. Um, Josh, public comment now or after the questions? Your, uh, your call, Chair. Okay. Well, why don't, why don't we have questions at this point, I think it could guide the, the public comment. So I, I will point out real quickly that in the board packet, there is like a 102, 103 page document that is our annual comprehensive financial report. So it's available for anybody to, to look through. And there is a lot of narrative that supports the financial uh, schedules themselves. Um, one thing to note, uh, I think that Jonathan pointed out, was that our revenue uh, operating revenue was fairly flat. As a matter of fact, it was a couple of hundred thousand dollars less this year than it was the prior year. That's even with the rate increase. So essentially, we saw no benefit from the rate increase for this year. People are using less water. People are using less water, correct. And then the other thing I think is um, important to note, Jonathan pointed out the uh, restricted and unrestricted net position figures. We did not have enough in funds this year to cover the unrestricted net position without having to draw from the operating contingency reserve. So that is something that we hope to reverse in subsequent years once we, once we uh, change our revenue picture a little bit. Any questions for either Jonathan or Leslie? Did you, Leslie, can you talk about some key numbers here that uh, the ratios that we have to um, maintain? So we do have we do have a minimum amount that we need to maintain in a debt coverage ratio, and that's actually um, uh, sh highlighted in our um, our debt covenants, our operating statements with our lenders. They require us to maintain a 1.2 debt coverage ratio because we never know when we're planning um, budget versus actual. We never know what the outcome is going to be until the year has elapsed. We give ourselves that little bit of padding by, by 
uh, setting a minimum 1.7 ratio internally so that we've got that buffer a little bit and we don't risk falling lower. Did you say 1.7? 1 1.7 is our target. And I believe this year, Jonathan, it was 3.69, if I'm not correct, on the debt coverage ratio. So it dropped a couple of percentage points from the prior year. And that's because of our increased debt load. I don't have any other questions. Any other board members? Okay, in that case, I'll open up to public comment. Two minutes, and please be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you. Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you for explaining some of these figures. I had a question about uh, some of them too. What would cause um, on the net position, I think that's on uh, page 207, there's a nice bar graph showing that. Um, I think that's where it is. Uh, the net position, what would cause it to to change so drastically from 118.5 million in 2022 to 148.5? You mentioned something about it involving 134 million in um, net asset investments, but I didn't quite understand that. Uh, if you could please explain what caused that that big increase again, uh, that would be very helpful. Um, I also noted that uh, there were a, a significant deferred payments in uh, pension liability. And that concerns me because one of the remedies that is being proposed to your board in a later item tonight regarding the rate increase is to, again, defer payments on the pension liability so that it's only a 10% instead of a 12% rate increase. I'm worried that in the long term, it will be more expensive um, to not pay that down more. And I hope there will be some financial discussion about that. Um, the operating revenues are not supporting the claim earlier that there was an $11 million shortfall due to people using less water. On page 159, it doesn't match up with that. It is lower, but um, not that much, not 11 million. Thank you for your comments. Rather than respond at this point, let's keep track of all the, co all the questions and comments, and then if uh, staff or, or board members want to respond, we'll respond at the end of it. Any other public comments? All right. That wasn't necessary. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to express my appreciation for Jonathan for taking the time to be here this evening and, and walk us through the process. Thank you, Jonathan. Absolutely. Thank you, Leslie. So do board members or staff want to respond to any of the public comments? I just also wanted to just briefly just also thank staff for making it so we get another unmodified opinion by auditors, meaning that's the highest rating they can give us. So, you know, that has to do with, you know, doing a really good, clear job and making it transparent. And so I appreciate all that work. And then I want to see if I understand the difference between the 118 and 148. I think that's capital investment. Yeah, it's correct? investment in capital assets. Absolutely. Like so pipeline. A lot of pipeline, a lot of, a lot of the work that's been done um, in the interim on Pure Water SoCal at the Chanticleer site, the conveyance pipeline, uh, SoCal drive main replacement, all of those big projects that we've been working on over the year have contributed to that increase in, in capital assets in that net position. It's, it's not liquid assets. It's not available for it is, us to spend. It is no. pipes in the ground. And, <laughs> uh, okay. No pun intended, right? All right. Um, any other comments from the staff or board or questions, discussions? It is very, like you said, over a hundred page document, but there's, there's a lot in there and 
it sets the um, the expense needs, which will then determine how the rates well, are treated. I'll move that we accept the report. Been moved. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Passes unanimously. Um, as I recall, there is. Was there, was there other things that were needed? No. Okay. All right. Well, that brings us to um, 7.3, which is a resolution of appreciation for honoring the 2023 Water Rates Advisory Committee. Yeah, and I'll take that one. And before I do, I just also want to express my appreciation for Leslie Ryan, the audit team. Um, you know, if you look at the work that Leslie produced, it's not only a financial document, but it's it's kind of a, a guidance document. The figures, the photos, and it's a kind of a work of art. It combines, you know, intersects with finance. So thank you, Leslie. So this item, uh, 7.3, is really, uh, it's all about the, uh, the public members that helped on the committee to uh, look at the rates and the rate structures and that sort of thing. We have uh, one of the members in the audience tonight. Um, it, you know, it's so important as we go through a process like this, looking at rate structures, uh, revenue need, uh, to have members of the public that uh, represent represent our customers. And I think we had eight of them this time. Is that right, Leslie? Eight? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Started with 10 and up, ended up with nine. Some of their pictures are shown here. And <clears throat> just, you know, sometimes you listen, you listen, all of a sudden uh, an insight comes from somebody uh, and you go, wow, that just alone makes it all worth it. And really guiding, trying to represent, um, well, representing their own perspectives, but I think providing a good cross-section of what our customer base is and would like to see. Uh, so, uh, so much thanks for them. And there is a resolution. We're glad to read it. Uh, uh, President um, Jaffe, you're, you can, or we can mail it. Go ahead and read it. That's okay. Do you mind doing that? This is resolution number 2313, resolution and appreciation of the members of the District Water Rates Advisory Committee. Volunteer Community Committee members Ilga Clemens, David Schwartz, Thomas Pistol, Mike Conant, Karen Preston McCarthy, Danny Ward, Michael Gutierrez is here tonight, Michael Thornton, and Maureen Dwyer. The Board of Directors of the Soquel Creek Water District at its December 19th, 2023 board meeting made the following findings, recitals. Whereas members of the board, members of the District Water Rates Advisory Committee are valued customers of the Soquel Creek Water District. And whereas interested ratepayers applied for and members were appointed in April 2023 as voluntary community com committee members to the Board Ad Hoc Water Rates Advisory Committee, and whereas members volunteered their time attending meetings and providing valuable insight, input, and recommendations as part of the district's 2023 water rate study, and whereas members are an important voice of the Soquel Creek Water District, offering a variety of perspectives of our ratepayer community and providing focused input to the Board of Directors on water rate structure and design based on options and objectives provided by the Board. And whereas members have demonstrated a commitment to the Soquel Creek Water District and their community water supply. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we all join in extending our sincere appreciation for service as committee members to the following and it lists the names that I just said previously. Passed and adopted by the Board of Directors of the Soquel Creek Water District this 19th day of December, 2023. Okay. Would anybody like to make the motion? Oh, public comments, sorry. Thanks, Tom. Okay, seeing no public comment, would anybody like to make the motion? 
Sorry, I'll make the motion to um, approve the resolution. I'll second. <clears throat> Moved and seconded. We have to do a roll call vote. That's what it says in the, in the packet. A voice vote would be acceptable as well. All right, well, let's do a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? <clears throat> Passes unanimously. And I want to personally thank all the members of the committee who put their time into this and it's very helpful. Including thank you, Rochelle and Carla, oh, yeah. for your time. It was very interesting. It was great to meet everybody on the committee. They're really committed, uh, very sincere, and uh, asked really good questions. Um, so at the end, by the end of the our last meeting, we had very intelligent comments. Okay. And thank you, Leslie, too, because you did a lot of the yeah, information and the structure for the meeting. I don't know. Should I just say ditto? <laughs> you can. <clears throat> so that brings us to 7.4, acceptance of Raftelis rate study report, executive summary. And you once again, you, Leslie. Right? So, yeah, we're here again this evening. Um, we have uh, Kevin Kostick and Melissa Elliott from Raftelis uh, here to present this evening. We're going to start the presentation, however, with a quick intro by Melanie and Ron again, just to kind of uh, set the set the scene a little bit for customers who may not be aware um, of the circumstances under which we're setting rates currently. And then Kevin will take it from there. Great, good evening. Thank you, Emma, for loading up the, the slide deck. I have the opportunity to kind of be the, uh, the intro to the rate study presentations over the last couple of meetings. And again, um, I have a couple of slides to just kind of, again, reiterate and emphasize a little bit about who SoCal Creek Water District is, what we do and provide to the community, and then, of course, I think I'm going to have Ron join tonight and talk a little bit about the challenges that we're facing. So again, just as introductions, this is your team tonight if you have questions related to this item. So again, um, a couple of times so far I've shown an infographic and today is maybe I'm getting to be a little nostalgic. It's the end of the year and just of course, I love pictures. I have a series of photos that I think help to explain who the district is and what we do. So as many of you know, the district is a not-for-profit local government agency. We are special in the fact that we are dedicated to the mission of water resources here in our region. Um, specifically within the mission, it's to provide a safe and high quality, reliable and sustainable water supply to meet our community's present and future needs in an environmental sensitive and economically responsible manner. These are just some photographs of some of our employees that are doing their duty um, and working around the community. So we're a staff of 48 lean employees. It's a number that really hasn't changed much. Um, over the years and are governed by an elected board of five board of directors. Uh, we oversee um, a lot of capital infrastructure here. These are just some photographs <clears throat> that I'm showing. This one here is showing one of our 18 tanks that we have throughout our system. We also have over 170 miles of pipeline, 20 production wells, 80 groundwater monitoring wells, and of course, we have a staff that also provides services such as sampling and water quality, um, answering telephones to our customers. And then, of course, we have a really robust conservation program where we did a lot of uh, conservation water-wise house calls. We also um, have to provide water 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, in normal weather conditions as well as inclement weather conditions. Just in this last year, you'll notice that we had, uh, we made national news when we had a creek in our community blow out with a storm drain. We lost a water line 
and we had to put that community back into service. We also have just daily kinds of disasters that happen. This is where we had a fire hydrant um, down in Soquel Village get hit. And so in these kinds of situations, our staff has to also go out and mitigate and resolve issues. And then, of course, on that right-hand side is, is, again, our crews putting in some pipeline. Um, Ron, you want to hit on this part? Yes, thank you, Melanie. Well, you would think uh, those challenges you just saw before you would be enough, but really the big one is sitting right here in front of us on the screen, and that is we have been designated as a critically overdrafted basin, one of 21 basins out of over 500 in the state of California. So it is the most dire designation you can get by the state. What that means is that we have to have the basin in sustainability by 2040, and it's a big task. Next slide. So seawater intrusion is our big challenge, our nemesis, and this map on your right shows from right there, that's our service area circled in yellow, and going down all the way to Monterey, uh, all that red is seawater intrusion that has occurred. And down in Monterey, it's almost uh, getting to Salina. So that's about 10 miles inland there. Thank you, Melanie. Three miles inland down up around Pajaro Valley. And then if you go up to our area, the, the, the question we always had is we know we detected it both ends of our district right there and at the other side, but we didn't know where it was where that red line is until we flew that device on shown in that picture. So the Danish approached us, we formed a technical advisory committee, and they flew it. Uh, the good news is it worked. The bad news is the determination was where seawater intrusion is not already detected onshore in our monitoring wells, it is right at the shoreline, um, about you know just knocking on the door to come in and, and ruin our well field. And our hydrologist a while back before we put in a lot of precautions and our board declared um, stage three curtailment said it was just a matter of a couple of years if we didn't curtail pumping and manage it in a different way temporarily to, to try to slow it down. It would just be a couple of years before it decimated our main well field. So 2014, the board went into hyperdrive on that, thankfully, because we didn't have those results at the time. So now that we show that it's right at the shoreline, it's very um, fruitful that we did. And here's, here's just another map showing uh, the whole basin, the Santa Cruz Mid-County Basins outlined in black. And again, the red represents seawater intrusion down under the earth in the aquifers that was flown by the, the Danish outfits. So next slide, please, Melanie. And, you know, seawater intrusion and pumping, it's underground. It's hard to understand. That's why it, it probably has impacted the majority of the places, coastal regions of the world that rely uh, just on groundwater. They've already been, had their aquifers contaminated. And I'd say the ones that haven't will unless they take steps like us. So part of that reason is it's because it's hard to see it's underground. So we wanted to present a slide or two to kind of show you what that really is. So there's a production well, is a cross section, and you can see the red area arrows are simulating seawater coming into that well. Now, Look at, the look, look at the height of the water in that well, that little cartoon well, if you will. And let's go to the next slide, or is this the animation? There's no animation. Okay, the next slide, please. And so, well, yeah, when, you, when, the, when the water level goes up a little bit, it feeds water out toward the ocean instead of pulling it in. And so here you can see what the uh, recharge wells, replenishment wells, are for pure water SoCal, what they're designated to achieve, just like down in Orange County. So you put water in there, some of it may flow back to a, a, another pumping well, and then some of it flows out into the ocean to prevent further seawater intrusion. So it's a hydraulic barrier, if you will. Okay, next slide. Thank you, Melanie. And you know, we, we, we talk a lot about cost, right? And cost is very important. Um, seems like cost of everything has gone up and, it's, and we're all battling with it. Uh, but I, I think, Cost is only part of the equation, right? It's really about value. So it can, some can cost a lot and be a great value or cost very little and not be a good value. So I, I would encourage us to think about value. 
versus just cost. And we, the board commissioned a study by Professor Haddad up at UCSC to do an economic analysis for uh, pure water, our sustainable water supply. And the, and the economic study had a host of things in it. It's on our website. It basically said two main things. One, this is, this is a big benefit, economic benefit to the, uh, to the region. You know, almost a billion dollars, if you, you can see it up there. And then I think even more important and germane to tonight is what would be the impacts without Pure Water SoCal? And the study said that basically you'd have to pay more water than what we would be then, and I mean more money and use less water. Again, let me repeat that. Without Pure Water SoCal, the study said you'd have to use, you'd have to pay basically three times more for your water and use less. So I think, again, value is, is, a, is a big one to, to focus on. And next slide, please, Melanie. Thank you. Public engagement is near and dear to our heart. This just shows a couple things that uh, we've been doing and continue to do. I know there's a, public, a couple, two more public forums out there, um, maybe more, uh, regarding the rates to try to inform people so they can make their uh, best decisions possible. Next slide. And we touched on this, but we intentionally had this in here. Um, again, we can't overstate the value of having public members working with our board members uh, to and staff to, to provide their perspective input. I don't think we would have arrived at as good a place as we have uh, in representing uh, the, the, the values that the board prom promulgated at the beginning, which was uh, fairness and equity. So I think this rate structure accomplishes that the best way uh, possible, uh, financial stability, and of course, legal defensibility. So that concludes my portion. And from that, I'll hand it just back to Kevin. Thank you. You're on. Good evening, directors, President Jaffe, uh, members of the public, Kevin Kostick from Raftelis. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so we're gonna talk about establishing rates, the data we use, the principles that guide our work. Um, that's just a transition, so let's go to our next one. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, okay, sorry. Uh, so Melanie pointed out some, uh, some photos of infrastructure. I think it's important to remember what our utility revenues actually fund. So for the district, 167 miles of pipe, 16 groundwater wells, 18 tanks, 80 monitoring wells, serving 16,000 connections. Uh, producing close to a billion gallons of water a year. So that's a lot of infrastructure that underlies the utility uh, and a lot of costs that go into uh, providing that level of service. Next slide. So we've seen this slide before in a slightly different format. <clears throat> so we start our rate setting process with the rate setting framework. We talk about our fin financial goals, policy objectives, pricing objectives, different rate structures for evaluation. Next up is the financial plan. We look out over a 10-year planning horizon to inform our rates, uh, in this case for the next four years. Uh, after that is our cost of service analysis and uh, evaluating rate alternatives, modeling those, uh, conducting impact analyses. And then we get into study documentation. So once we have a proposal, uh, developing a study report, having that reviewed by legal counsel. Uh, and then last step is the rate adoption procedures. So here in California, we have to send a notice to all of our uh, owners of record, our metered connections, and hold a public hearing uh, at least 45 days after the postmark of that notice. So we're at step four. We're finishing up step four with staff and legal. And uh, if authorized tonight, we'll begin that fifth step. Uh, Ron mentioned the board's guiding principles. So first and foremost, legal defensibility. Uh, we've worked with legal counsel every step of the way from kicking off this study to uh, discussions with the advisory committee, uh, rate alternatives, et cetera. Financially, uh, financial sustainability uh, to meet financial obligations from uh, rate revenues. Right? We don't have uh, much non-rate revenues. We don't have other sources of income. Your utility, uh, <laughs> I keep hearing children outside. Uh, the utility uh, funds all of its costs really through uh, the, the rates the customers pay. And then the last is social uh, equitability. 
So well, there we, we mean fairness in rates between different user classes, within user classes, but also between current users and future users. Next slide. So if we step through those objectives and kind of how they weave their way into the rates that we'll see tonight. So financial sustainability, we develop a financial plan that has annual incremental revenue increases so we don't have sharp fluctuations uh, in rates as we step through the years. Social equitability, uh, talking about how we recover our base and sustainability costs going forward, and also developing the three-tier rate structure for residential users that you see in this proposal. And then financial sustainability and social equitability, that's increasing the degree of fixed revenue that we recover from our rates from 40% up to 60%, having that fixed revenue source. Next slide. I mentioned long-range financial plan. Uh, the proposal is for a 10% overall revenue increase in the first year. So that's the current fiscal year that would be implemented in March if the, the proposal uh, is authorized and adopted. And then 12% overall revenue increases in years two, three, and four. So in the first year, that 10% is spread differently between customer classes based on the rate structure modifications and the updated cost of service. In years two, three, and four, all customers will see their rates increase at 12% per year. Uh, we've also touched on public outreach. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we acknowledge the advisory committee uh, again tonight. That was a series of meetings, as you'll see in the next slide, uh, where we did a, a real deep dive into rate setting with that committee. Uh, we have rate videos. Staff has hosted special events. We'll have more of those in the future. Uh, the QuickSip e-blast in multiple, multiple months. Uh, we had a rates webinar uh, with the community last month. We'll have another one in January. And then district newsletters and, and social media posts and so forth. Uh, the Water Rates Advisory Committee first met in August. So that was a rehash of the, the prior rate setting, or the prior rate study, rather, the 218 process, talking about communications and outreach efforts. In September, we got into the weeds of the financial plan, what goes into a long-range financial plan, what are the, the assumptions, uh, and uh, the data that goes into that. In October, we talked about cost of service, we talked about rate alternatives, uh, and then in late October, we started looking at rates. We had preliminary rates, and then we came back uh, to the committee for a fifth time in early to mid-November, talking about uh, the final rate proposal, so kind of the all-in, what does it look like when we restructure rates and add in additional revenue needs. Uh, the committee provided uh, staff, uh, us as consultants, and the board some very good feedback, or input rather. So the study has to address the long-term financial needs of the district, which obviously we have ever-increasing costs, uh, inflationary pressures, we have uh, cost structure changes with the implementation of Pure Water SoCal, uh, so we need to address those needs. And then increasing fixed revenue recovery to address that board objective of financial sustainability. The committee did not support a uniform rate structure option uh, for water use rates. Uh, their preference was for either a revised two-tier for residential or a three-tier residential structure uh, where they lean towards the three-tier, and we brought that to you first in November, just before Thanksgiving, and then uh, a revised proposal on the 5th of this month. So if we step into cost of service and rate design, next slide, please. Uh, so cost of service analysis relies foundationally on what we developed the last rate cycle. Uh, we'll address some of the larger changes. So the first being uh, the modification to how we recover, how we identify and recover base and sustainability costs. So the existing methodology that we used allocated 20% of those costs to uh, what we call a basin-wide benefit. So that identified the costs of uh, the district share of management of the Mid-County GSA, about 20%. Uh, of those costs, and then the re remaining 80% for water reliability, and that was recovered from the residential class in the tier two rate that you see in the current rate structure. The proposal is to update that, and the basis is to say, what is the basin-wide benefit as a seawater intrusion barrier versus what's the benefit of supplemental water for those users uh, that require larger volumes of water, greater than what the safe field of the basin can provide. When we step through that analysis, we arrive at a uh, about 45% for water reliability, that's a supplemental supply component, and then the remainder being the basin-wide benefit. So when we update that methodology, 
We ensure that large volume users pay their share for supplemental water costs and those needs greater than what this, the basin can provide. And then those who benefit from these basin-wide benefits of seawater intrusion barrier, both now and in the future, pay for that benefit that they receive. Next slide. So another, uh, this is a rate structure change, but also within the cost of service analysis, is to recover a greater share of our uh, rate revenues from fixed sources, so from our meter-based charges. And currently you recover about 40%, or the, I should say the, the prior rate study targeted 40% of our total revenues from fixed sources. And now we're gonna flip that 40% fixed and 60% variable ratio to 60% fixed and 40% variable. Next slide. And we can, we can pass that one, that was a duplication. Uh, proposed rate structure modification. So for the, for the residential class for which we have a two-tier structure right now, the proposal is for a three-tier structure um, based on the, the units in each tier that you see here. So tier one for residential would be up to 3.99 units per month, a unit being uh, 100 cubic feet or 748 gallons of water. That basis is based on the average winter needs of your community, so it's a proxy for indoor use. And that's very efficient. Second tier and intermediate tier uh, from four up to 7.99, looking at kind of peak summer needs of the uh, residential class. And then tier three at eight or above, uh, that would be all water use greater than that second tier. So a new three tier structure. And if we go to the next slide, we'll compare these, the current and proposed. So again, the current structure, uh, two tier, uh, first tier at $9.10 per unit, and then uh, we quickly jump up to $41.23. Uh, the proposal would update that. So now tier one, the, the price for tier one basically stays the same, only up six cents, though the, uh, the use in that, or the allotment in that tier rather, reduces from 5.99 to 3.99. Then we have an intermediate tier from four to eight at $10.27 and then a new tier three again at $16.22 per unit of water. The next series uh, of slides just show our, our final rates. So first is the series of fixed rates. So the first being meter-based charges for residential and commercial users, residential being both single family and multifamily. Uh, the kind of key one here is the five eighths inch meter. That's where most of our single family uh, connections are and, and the majority of our connections overall are at the 5 8 inch mark. So you see the current rate there, uh, roughly $52 uh, up to a proposed rate of $80. Considering both that additional revenue needed in the financial plan, the, the structuring changes of recovering a higher degree from uh, fixed sources and then recovering our, uh, our basin sustainability, those basin-wide benefit costs within the fixed charges. If we go to the next slide, we'll see the same schedule, but for the irrigation and outdoor use class. Now these charges are differentiated based on the peaking characteristics between single family or residential and commercial rather and irrigation users. So irrigation users have a higher peak, therefore they're allocated a higher share of those extra capacity costs. And you see that reflected uh, when here where you see the five, inch, five eighths inch connection uh, at roughly $116, my glasses aren't Good enough to see that, I suppose. $116 versus the five eighths for the single family uh, at roughly $80. So you see that differential based on peaking again. Next slide. Uh, private fire service charges are just simply an update uh, based on the same methodology using the prior cost of service analysis, uh, just updating with uh, updated costs, updated uh, customer demands, and uh, our updated revenue needs. Uh, next slide. And then we have our water use rates. So again, proposed three-tier structure for residential. So single family being one unit, residential, multifamily residential uh, would be tiered per dwelling unit. Uh, you see the introduction of the third tier there under the proposed March 2024 column. And then in subsequent years, those increasing by the overall increase. So that being 12% per year. And then the uniform rates, uh, we have commercial and irrigation, and those rates in fact going down in the proposal because we're updating our fixed charges to recover a greater degree there. So those charges uh, in fact go down in the first year. And then lastly, uh, water shortage emergency rates. 
Uh, we wanted to model these to have available to the district in the future, mindful that these are uh, always discretionary, always temporary, um, but we're showing an illustration here for the, the current fiscal year, so this would be an illustration of year one, and simply saying that in shortage, we have reductions in water sales revenues, we have some degree of avoided costs, we also have some degree of additional costs in conservation and outreach, and basically trying to recover that net difference uh, from the rates. Uh, so, pre, for example, in stage one, tier one, you see uh, a rate of $9.61 relative to what the base rates would be, which, if I recall correctly, are $9.16, so about a $0.45 cent, uh, difference there. Next slide. So as far as customer impacts, uh, what we're showing here is a single family user at five units a month with a five eighths inch connector uh, connection. That's about the uh, the typical or average customer for the district. Right now, a current bill of just under $98. The proposal uh, would see that bill increase to $127, roughly a $30 increase, 98 cents per day. And the next slide shows uh, a higher user single family uh, bill still at a 5 8 inch connection but using nine units of water per month now with the rate structure changing with uh, the cost being uh, recovered more from fixed charges this user would actually see a decrease on the order of uh, nearly two dollars per day so just to wrap up uh, some of the key points on the proposal overall uh, first our basin sustainability costs we differentiate between that or supplemental supply, which stays within the water use rates, and then the basin-wide benefit that goes to the fixed charge by meter size. The fixed charges are recalibrated, so now we're recovering 60% of our costs from fixed sources rather than the current uh, roughly 40. We're introducing a third tier, so a three-tier uh, water use rate for residential users. And then the impacts overall are gonna vary based on those three considerations, as well as the overall increase in revenue needs, which in the first year is 10%. As far as next steps, uh, our, our remaining meeting schedule, so we're here tonight on the 19th. If the proposal is authorized by your board tonight, uh, we would uh, commence noticing customers the first week of January. Uh, we have a rate study informational webinar scheduled for Thursday, January 25th on Zoom. Uh, we'll have an open house in person at Temple Beth L. Uh, on February 8th at 6 p.m. And then uh, the, the study would conclude with a public hearing on February 20th here at 6 p.m. We've talked a lot about public outreach. Uh, we've got a dedicated web page uh, on the district site for about the rate study. Uh, there's FAQs there. The rate study report will be there. The Prop 218 notice will be there. Uh, We've had utility bill inserts, social media posts, as I mentioned, uh, the FAQs, et cetera. So I direct customers to uh, visit that page. I'm gonna interrupt real quick. Um, Kevin, in addition to the outreach that was shown on the previous slide, we are going to be adding a rate calculator to the website so customers can go on and see themselves what the impact would be to their their particular bill. Um, and then the other thing we're working on will be a bill insert going out in January to um, encourage people to sign up for that low income household water assistance program. We'll, we'll add another bill insert on that. So those are some additional outreach items going out. So tonight, um, what we're asking the board to consider is to accept the draft rate study report executive summary that was included in the board packet and direct us to proceed with publication of the full rate report. Um, also to direct staff to proceed with publication of and mailing of the required Proposition 218 notice um, to authorize us to set a public hearing for February 20th to consider uh, the adoption of the proposed rates, or you always have the option again to take no action. All right, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I think, um, again, if the board members have any clarifying questions, you should you do that here, it could guide the public comment. Is, are there any 
clarifying questions from the board? Yes, Tom. Um, yeah, two, uh, two. One is, um, I cannot remember, this could be staff, um, what percentage of our overall expenses are fixed just for, I think it's 90. Yeah, typically it's in excess of 95%. Okay. So just, just, you know, I know that, you know, I had trouble with going from 40 to 60, um, but I just, I wanted to be reminded of how much of our actual costs are fixed. And then a question maybe for, for Kevin, even after rates are adopted, they're assuming a water consumption of like 2,600 acre feet. And I know the previous rate study used 2,900. And I'm just curious if water use did go up to 2,900 feet in the next year, how would that affect the need for a rate increase the following year? Like I know it's, we could go up to 12%, but like I'm just thinking ahead and thinking, okay, well, what if Water use is more than we expected. We don't know what the weather's going to be like. Who knows? And I was just thinking if we're maybe ahead of the game, then we wouldn't have to raise them. But I just wondered if it was up to that 2,900, what, where would we be, do you think? I, I wouldn't want to put a specific dollar figure on what that additional 300 acre feet would be. Um, but I'd say that the reminder is the rates that you notice are always a maximum you have the discretion to implement something lower. And so you could direct staff to evaluate the financial plan and basically an, uh, an annual update at that point to say, well, do we need the full 12% or can we live with whatever it is, 8% or 9%? I, I guess, you know, that would be on an annual basis rather than kind of revisiting years two, three, and four all at the same. I right. meant annually. Yeah. And then annually, correct. Yeah, I believe when we ran the financial model the first time, we looked at 2,900 acre feet as a possible, you know, as a comparison scenario, and it was an 8.5% increase at that time. That's correct. Okay. Assuming all that, expenses that remain me. equal. Yeah. Thanks. Any, any more clarifying questions from the board? Seeing none, it's time to open it up for public comment. Um, I would like to just point out real quick a number that a number that jumped out to me when I was looking through all of these is um, the potential impact, um, the maximum potential impact, all water use remaining equal, right, looks to be about $30. Um, that's the most a customer would be impacted, which is actually still less than one single unit that a Tier 2 customer currently experiences. All right, just want to remind you, you have two minutes. Please be respectful of everyone's time. I'll and be speedy. I, I know you will. And and then uh, I think what works best is rather than respond to any questions or any thoughts after each speaker to wait until all the speakers have, have had an opportunity to, spread, to comment. All right. Okay. John? Hi, my name is John Cole. Uh, the first thing I want to do is thank you in advance if you actually take a look at this uh, suggested protest form. And this is the last one you did in 2019. It would be really great. Uh, and so I want to thank you in advance if you do consider it and direct the staff to include it. Uh, the other item I want to talk about, though, is I have some serious concerns about the executive summary. There's some statements in there that are, to me, this is my opinion only, problematic with respect to Proposition 218. We already know that the project is currently in construction and PWS operations are anticipated to commence in fiscal year 2025. When it's completed, the district will incur operating costs that average $5.5 million annually. That's not my concern. My concern is this statement. To smooth the effects on rates, PWS O&M is pre-funded in fiscal year 2024 to help offset the shift in cost structure in fiscal year 2025. In this one, OEM includes cost centers related to groundwater production, system operations, district personnel, customer service, administration, and future pure water SoCal operating costs. So you're going to collect revenue for the cost of a service that will not be provided until sometime 
fiscal year 2025. The district is not delivering a PWS supplemental water supply, nor a basin-wide benefit, so how can you allocate PWS costs now into the proposed rates when PWS, the PWS doesn't exist? This is a violation of Prop 218, in my mind, it's my mind, I'm not an expert. No, no fee or charge may be imposed for a service unless that service is actually used or immediately available to, you, to the owner of the property. Fees or charges based on potential or future use of a service are not permitted. Thank you, John. I, I, you know, you need to seriously consider that. Yeah. All right. Any other uh, public comments? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. First of all, I think that this item should have been a notice public hearing because the uh, way it is described in the agenda does not really uh, allow the public to know that the discussion and settle the approval of a rate increase is even part of that agenda item. So it has not been, in my opinion, properly described to pique the public's interest in coming, and it should have been a public hearing that was noticed. Prop 218 requires uh, for rate increases that the need be clear, clearly um, relayed, be justified uh, that it is needed and what the expense is, and the proportional cost of the service is spread um, to those who are going to be paying for it proportionally. I don't see that explanation made very clearly here. For example, what do you mean by basin sustainability? That is not a clear term uh, in dollars and cents. Um, how much money are we talking about? We have heard in the past an $11 million shortfall, but I don't hear that now. So the, it has to be more clearly described and justified to the public. Um, I also want to point out that at the Mid-County Groundwater Agency meeting last week, Georgina King said the basin's doing pretty well. I just want to leave you with that. I want an uh, explanation of the 55% the uh, basin-wide benefit and the 45% water uh, reliability. How was that determined? These seem like numbers that were just kind of thrown out. And then at the end, there was something mentioned, 60% of it would come from the big users. I'm, I'm not hearing any justification for these figures. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any other members of the public would like to comment? Steve, um, Steve Braff, um, resident uh, and a uh, household of six people who's been bearing the brunt of these higher rates for higher users. And I wanna say, I, I seem this is a promising adjustment for creating some equity. I felt for some, for some time now that having parents live with me and young children that I was bearing a brunt for something that we all should have equal access to. So I like the, the where you've gone with this three tier. It looks like there may be some relief that I'm hoping for because I could not take any more in the other direction uh, being a household of six. And I don't think my situation is unique given the need to have higher density uh, living. So thank you for the effort that was put on this. Thank you for the presentation. It was informative and helpful. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Merry Christmas. My name is Michael Gutierrez, a resident here of uh, Aptos for 20 years. I have just one in my household, but I've got a big lawn. I took notes and stuff like that. I'm not going to read it. I've, part of the water uh, rate advisory committee had the privilege of working with a lot of people. It was well thought out. I'm a water drinker, but I'm not a water expert. I feel that it was based off of transparency, equity, and sustainability. I'm on a fixed income fighting cancer. But as I look forward to the future, 
for my son, my grandchildren. I want preservation of water. As Ron said, it's about value. And I value water. And I value the team that was assembled. I learned a lot. I'm an executive from a previous life. I don't know anything about water pricing. I know how to finance price financial products or investment products. But it's amazing. I have 47 seconds. And how you price water is amazing. Water is an asset. We all need water. And I want to thank you for the recognition from the board. I enjoyed being part of the committee, learned a lot, and respect how we price water. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. And thanks again for being a part of that committee. Any other public comment? Okay. So do we have to... Do we have to move to close the public comment or just do it? No, it's not, it wasn't an official public hearing, so we just now bring it back to the board for any okay. potential action this evening. All right. Anybody, any board member um, want to address any of the, the comments that were made? Or staff, do you want to address any of the comments that were made? We're, we're glad to answer any questions. If you want to direct us to any, otherwise we'll, we're, we're fine. Thank you. I think for the to help the, the public, uh, the, if you could clarify the difference between it, a board meeting and a public hearing. Just what are the criteria, just for our people here? Yeah, I, I think it's an important point on that. Um, so Prop 218 has very specific procedural requirements, um, and one of those, and the most important one, is that before the board um, moves forward with um, increased rates, we're required to have a public hearing and for customers to receive notice of that public hearing 45 days in advance, as well as an opportunity to file written protests. And if we get written protests from a majority of affected parcels, we can't move forward, otherwise we can. Um, that's not what we're here doing here this evening, right? We're just starting that process um, to uh, approve the executive summary of the rate study and to authorize staff to issue the Prop 218 notices. Um, we spoke at the last meeting about how, you know, we are really going above and beyond um, and doing things that are not legally required. And this is another example of that. So um, under the law, it would be legal for staff to simply send out the 218 notice and finalize the, uh, the rate study without bringing it back to this board for adoption. But we know, you know the, the standards that you've set us to and the, and the importance of making sure that the public understands the need for this um, uh, rate increase. Um, and also all the hard work that went into it. Um, and so that's why this before you this evening, and it does not require a public hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I um, wanted to go back to the $11 million that... Could you get closer? To the oh, sorry. I would like to go back to the $11 million shortfall. It wasn't a net loss. It was a lessening of water sales, and you can see, uh, see it in the... Um, the consent agenda, there's a water production. You can see the year to year, the last three years, less water was produced to, to be sold than um, the actual, we were actual budget for it was. So there was a shortfall in our budget. It wasn't an actual loss because the water that didn't get pumped is not lost. It's still on the ground. But our water sales were down by, by a lot of money. And it didn't, you know, in this report, you only see the 22, 22 figures, and that is not $11 million worth of water. But it, it was a progressive year-to-year uh, -year decrease in water sales. Um, board, board Member Christensen, um, we actually have a slide that we developed a while back that we can illustrate that point if you'd like us to show it. Yeah. So, um, Emma, do you, do you have that? Oh, you have it here? Okay, thank you. So just in graphical form, what was said there at the top is trends in water use. I think you put this together, Leslie. Yeah, what this is showing you is the trends in water use over time from 2004 through 2023. And you can see how that water use has decreased. So when we compare the revenue we collected 
against what the revenue we expected to collect in the last rate studies finance plan, over the five years, we've come up with a cumulative shortfall of $11 million. It looks like that's really in the last three years. Yeah, basically a lot in the last three years. Which made it, I mean, the logical thing would be is if it were a long-term trend, you would have to raise rates to cover that shortfall because the, the cost, as previously discussed in this, uh, this meeting tonight and other meetings, we have fixed costs, and that, those costs are 95% of the cost of bringing water to the customer. Just to make it clear, the blue bar is projected and the red bar is actual. So we, we sell a service, but it's priced as a commodity. And that's where water gets so difficult. And okay, any other comments, questions? I would... Tom, you have something? Uh, just, you know, I was, um, one of the biggest things I wanted to see happen with this, these next rates was to make it fairer for people who happen to have larger families and just not as big a difference. It really bothered me, the big jump in tier two for, for some people that just had no choice um, in who was living with them. And so I think, you know, even if I don't like everything about the rates, I do like that. I think it's much more fair across the board. And I feel like, um, you know, I think everybody contributing to maintaining our base and sustainability is important. And, and I really wanted only to have 50% of the, you know, fixed costs. But I do understand with 95% fixed costs that it's just going to make it much more, you know, financially stable. So hopefully we won't have to, I'm, I'm still hoping we won't have to raise rates any, as much as we're setting them now, but um, I, I appreciate achieving that one goal that I wanted to see happen. Thank you. Jennifer, or Michelle. Uh, um. The whole reason I was supporting 60% is because I want us to be financially stable. Um, we do have to look at water use because at some point, you know, but, but above a certain level, um, we shouldn't be allowing it to be cheap and easy at, you know, for really high water users because they're depleting our groundwater if we encourage that. But I didn't want to. I know some people would like it to be 50 for that reason, but and then the the three tiers is what we were looking at because we wanted it to be more equitable for people that have larger families. And there were a lot of discussions about that and I agree with that. Go ahead. Hey, Jeff. Um, I just might contribute that um, it's been an incredible process um, and a lot of thought and a lot of work has gone into this and um, everyone is not going to be happy and rates are going to you know, go up. But I think that the board and the uh, rate advisory group and the district has done an amazing job. So I'm very happy to uh, have participated. Thank you. Um, yeah, three tiers gives us more flexibility. Um, I want to point out that one of the previous directors, Don Hornschmeyer, wanted to have an infinite number of tiers, <laughs> which where, where is actually a curve where you can make it do exactly what you wanted it to. Um, so... Becky brought up a question that I have. Thank you for bringing it up, Becky. On the 55%, 45%, and could you talk about where in the report you talk about that and how you came up with that? Yeah, I believe we have that in the executive summary, but um, 
So what we do, we look at first our, we know our aggregate demands. We know what the pure water project will provide. We also know that in the prior study, and we continue to maintain that in this study, that when we apportion the basin safe yield per connection, we're at about six HCF. So that's, that's why we have the threshold in the current two tier that we have for residential. So with, we take our customer billing data and we aggregate all the demand, every bill for every connection greater than six units a month, greater than what the safe yield per connection is. And that number is, I believe it's 681 acre feet. 681 acre feet out of a pure water project that delivers 1,500 acre feet of water, is 45%. So that's the 45% that goes to the supplemental supply component. The remainder being the basin-wide benefit that again is recovered across all users uh, on the fixed service charges. Okay, thank you. Um, Josh, here I ask about the future cost issue at this point, or is, is that opening up a can of worms? As far as? Well, the comment was that. No. Um, yeah, uh, the comment on, it, it's, it's absolutely true that Prop 218 requires that um, fees be charged for service that's actually available. Um, that is based on the, the utility service that's being uh, charged for, so in this case, water. It's not on a, you know, uh, necessarily a source of water or a project basis. Okay. I'll leave it for you to talk later <laughs> about it. Um, not perfect. Um, in my experience, um, None of our rates have been perfect. I, I do want to say that um, I do like that larger families have relief, um, but there's it's not to say that larger water users don't have relief with, so larger water users with smaller families also get relief. So that doesn't run me the right way. Um, like I say, it's not perfect. Uh, the, but I, I I think what it really signals is that we're having a, a paradigm shift here. Um, for my first 21 years on the board, uh, the, the mantra was protect the basin. And it still is, but it, we're getting closer to it. So um, what the, the shift for me is, is that we no longer um, have to be as as concerned as we were initially, as I was initially 20 years ago, that we really were headed on a path. The way it was described to me, it's like seawater intrusion is it's like a, a runaway train coming at you. And you know it's coming at you. You don't know how fast. And it's not easy to stop. And I think we have a, things in place to stop that train. So that, that allows me to support this type of rate structure where larger users um, are not encouraged as much to decrease their water use. Anyway, uh, anybody else have questions? Comments? Anybody want to make? Motions? I'll, I'll make a motion. Okay. There are three to be made. You want to do all three or? Yeah, I'll try it. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to make a motion to accept the draft rate study report executive summary, summary and direct staff to proceed with publication of the full rate study report and to direct staff to proceed with publication and mailing of the required Prop 218 notifications and to authorize staff to set a public hearing February 20th, 2024, to consider final adoption of the proposed rates. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. So Jennifer and Carla. All right. Um, again, we have the option of a voice or roll call. All in favor? 
Aye. 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 All opposed? Passes unanimously. All right. Thank you. So that moves us on to 7.5. Consider consolidation of the district's three standing committees. Yes, and since uh, Ms. Western uh, wrote this memo, I think she gets the uh, privilege of presenting it. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, so this memo is presented as a follow-up to an idea that we discussed briefly at the last meeting, and that is to consolidate the district's three standing committees into possibly one or two. So, uh, Melanie, if you could scroll down to the next page, it'll show the options that we came up with preliminarily. And this was based on some board feedback that we had gathered. So option one is to consolidate from three to two committees, and that would be to combine the Water Resources Committee and the Public Outreach Committee, and then leave the Finance Committee as is. Uh, you can see the details up there. Uh, we came up with a possible title. Um, and we would say to consider meeting bi-monthly for the combined committee and then continue meeting quarterly for finance. Um, option two is to consolidate from three to one committee. Uh, and that frequency would be bi-monthly. The meeting duration would be to increase it to an uh, hour and a half. And there's a possible title that we uh, threw out there, I think, at Tom's, Dr. Lahey's suggestion. Um, we also discussed uh, Director Balboni's idea about the youth uh, serving on a committee, and we feel like that discussion um, is really important and kind of stands alone from this one, so we would like to come back at a future meeting to discuss that uh, by itself. So the board can really do what, what you want to do with this, and um, those options were just to kind of generate some discussion for tonight. Any public comment? Seeing none, open it up to the board. I have a question for. Could you get up to the, the? It's just they can't hear you on the the recording. <laughs> Having served both on the public uh, awareness outreach and also the water, there is a lot of overlap, and so I I like that combination. I also like the idea of youth. They use a lot of water. <laughs> I, yeah, what my idea was that that would be a good place for the, to introduce you. There might be more public. Oh, you started to get up. I don't know if you were just changing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve Graff, I serve on the public outreach committee, and I would I would also uh, I also find it agreeable to consolidate down into two committees. All right. Um, Thank you. Sorry. No, I was just curious, like, you know, I've never served on a financial advisory um, committee, only on the other two, which to me seems like those could combine. But I was wondering, like, I think, I know Carla and maybe Rochelle have served on all three. Yeah. I was just wonder what you think about the how that seems like to me finance would be different, but, but I have not been there. Well, I, I've, I've had... Uh, I, I've gone back and forth on this one, you know, reading it. And because the finance meetings, they're not that many. We meet quarterly? Okay. So the, um, I guess I just have, I'm losing my memory here. Um, so all of them meet quarterly, but. No. Mm. I'm, I'm monthly. monthly. The finance, the finance committee meetings are quarterly. The others, I believe, are monthly. They just feel like they're more often, Ms. Okay. Every, bi-monthly. Bi-monthly. Bi -monthly. Okay. <laughs> quarterly <laughs> is every three months. Yeah. So it isn't as often. Exactly. But it is quarterly. Okay. I'm, you're, I'm head spinning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they don't meet as much, but... Um, and th there's not always exciting things happening in the other committees, and then we're meeting for an hour. And so I was thinking, oh, an hour and a half with all, you know, and 
it may be a different committee meeting. I mean, it may have different information and not as much of one as the other at every meeting, right? So, um, I don't know. I mean, that's what we, the quarterly one could be fine to be quarterly, and, you know, I would go either way. Somebody has to convince me because <laughs> they both seem like pretty good options. I know. Well, I think that, I mean, I know the agenda on the two, um, the WRMI and the public outreach committees are similar. They're still, their focuses are different. So I don't know how, if we combine them, how that would uh, add to the, uh, and I say having, um, Helped with the selection of the uh, participants of the committees the last time we set up, had uh, people join the committees. Um, it seemed like there were some specific specialties and specializations in direction. Some people were more interested in infrastructure, mm -hmm. others were uh, more interested in outreach. And then, of course, our finance committee was has moved, the membership has moved a little bit, but it they were focused, they were clearly equipped to discuss financial uh, assessments. So I don't know. I, I, I think it's a good idea, but I don't know. We might destroy some of the, the uh, give and take that is a hallmark of the committees, committee meetings. One thing I was thinking, I got an intimation maybe from your um, comments in here, just that if you did have just one committee, say it was met six times a year, you would still have, probably you could focus certain meetings on certain topics so that it's not just the same each time. Like you might have two a year that are really focused on finance or, you know, whatever. I don't know how that would work, but um, probably the easiest transition is to just combine the two and leave finance separate, but graduation yeah. you know so is the goal to get more people at a meeting by having it come combining combining the two groups i guess that was the original thing because it start the groups start off oops, sorry the groups start off uh larger and then i think um because we've had to cancel meetings and things like that the scheduling we've had people drop off are you serving cookies <laughs> We did, yeah. We did, yeah. <laughs> Gales, actually. Do it. If that would bring them in, I would definitely do that every meeting. So I promise that. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I hear what you know. There's could be some differences. I, I get with the type of person who would join the the outreach and the type of person who would join the uh, water resources management. There might be some people, you know, who, who want both. So as long as the agenda is clear, then, then people could decide, you know, whether they attend or not. They always can decide. I, um, I have an, an insight. Okay. Um, I don't think I've been on the, on the public outreach committee, for one, but I have to say that in my job away from here, I think maybe I needed more public outreach education. So for water, you know, for water resources and, you know, and, and the projects, it may be a good thing to mix them because they are interrelated. And I think sometimes the people that are interested in the water resources side um, just don't get that you really do need the public outreach to make it a, a successful project. So maybe a May I make a suggestion as well? <clears throat> I think in terms of the outreach committee, which you can see we have active engagement and it is, a, I think, a, a core guiding principle of the board. You could also consider having a standing item related to outreach at both the Water Resources Infrastructure Committee and the Finance. It does seem that there always is a topic related to outreach that if you wanted to absorb, dissolve, or do something with the outreach where it's a it's a component of the other two committees. I think it would be appropriate to do so. Um, the other thing, though, I, I think we should just kind of think about is the attendance and the space. 
availability. So by combining meetings, does that impact the number of committee members that we may get or not get? I think it, sometimes it, there's an ebb and flow related to the participation. So we are, we have a small room, um, which is the learning center at the district, and then we have a larger space at the Rosedale trailer that we could also use. So just kind of put that out there. Oh, so we do have more space. I'm not gonna that. So you combined all three into that small conference room, I don't think we'll do that. So and are, perhaps are you, you could also you could also maybe have periodic meetings where you combine the committees, maybe once a year. Oh. So, Melanie, were you suggesting two groups, uh, one with uh, the water resources and infrastructure slash outreach, and the other finance, business finance services, and outreach? Outreach. Interesting. Okay, so what I think is, after giving it careful thought, I think that um, the public advisory committee three in one would be really cool going forward. And this is why I think so, because um, it's possible that people really need some extra financial education, even though they might not like really want it. And it would create um, slightly more well-rounded, educated participants. And I think it would be a larger group, um, which would be more exciting. And um, it would also be kind of simple. And I think this, we, we've had such a great experience in the past couple of years. I've been on the, I mean, look at me. I'm a good um, example. I was on the infrastructure committee and now I'm here. So I think it is kind of a goal to maybe um, have people join it and step up to um, bigger things, you know, to more commitments. Um, so the single group, I think public advisory committee, what a great name. Thanks, Tom. I would definitely vote for that. Okay. okay. So do, do we need to do a motion? I mean, I guess the other thing I was going to just add is that we're clearly not locked in whatever we try. I mean, right. you know, we we've we didn't even have these, you know, ten years ago. So, yeah. you know, good point. <laughs> you know, it, we don't have. We can try something, and and if. Do it for a year and see where we are. Yeah. You no. Know? Oh, is there a motion? I've heard many different things. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I'll just add before yes. we do the motion is um, I think we're the board's leaning towards the first motion. So um, it's left open ended here, but what uh, staff would need is the directors that would be appointed to serve. Um, the committee title, the meeting frequency, and the meeting duration. Thank you. We can't be wishy-washy is what you're saying. <laughs> Very clear. <laughs> I'd, I'll defer to the people who've been most involved with the committees to... I think the one and a half hour, that's good. Um, I think we were running over a lot anyway. Yeah, so on one subject. So what if we try? I'll, I'll put a, a motion that we have a single committee, public out, public advisory um, committee, and that they're six times a year, um, and that there are. Um, what else did you need to know? How long are the meetings? An hour and a half. And the chair and the vice chair. Well, and then we'll have to. Well, we'll have a chair and a vice chair when we establish, and then we can talk about who wants to yeah. serve, right? So that's just the, that's enough. Is there for a second one to that motion. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Okay. So <laughs> we we've gone from three to one. Okay. So six six meetings a year, an hour and a half per meeting. Yeah. So, okay. Now, for the second part, uh, who from the board is going to be part of these? I'm a good arm wrestler, so I'm <laughs> definitely wanting to be the vice chair, if possible, because I really enjoyed doing okay. that. I think this is automatically is because of the nature. It's just two board members who will be attending this. So right. they're just In an alternate. In an alternate. I mean, I'd be interested, but if somebody else wants to, that's fine. I'm willing to be an alternate, too. 
Um, but Carla, you've been most involved with this. Do you want to chair this new committee? Oh, the whole committee? Yeah. No? Sure. At least for one year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the second motion is I'd, I'd like to move that the chair of the, the new, newly formed single committee is, is, is Carla Christensen, and the vice chair is Jennifer Balboni. And the alternate? Alternate, we haven't decided yet. I mean, we're all three of us willing. Can all three be alternates? I guess we could. Yeah, we There's could. No right? yeah. Is there, Josh, can we have multiple alternates, or does it have to be one alternate? No. Yeah, just have one. I don't have to. So we, yeah, we have to be a little careful with alternates on committees just because you can have an inadvertent serial meeting if you have the uh, alternate stepping in and there's a conversation that's right, continuing right. from a prior meeting. Okay, so we don't know alternates. Okay. Well, you can have an alternate, but you, know, you have, have to, to be, be careful. thoughtful about you know when they step in. So, Tom, you expressed an interest. And Rochelle. It's fine. So it sounds like, a, and I'll add Tom as the alternate. So, Carla, a second. Chair, Vice Chair Jennifer, and alternate Tom. And then second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. No one. So that passes unanimously as well. Can we meet at the same time as the WRMI committee Tuesdays at 4 o'clock? Yes. Are details to be worked out. That'd be great. We'll, we'll work with the. Chair and Vice Chair, thank you. Okay. So now we're. It, it does depend on the availability of the, the the chairperson and also the consensus right. among the people who sure. have to participate. Sure. Yeah. Actually. And then so we'll we to, um. At the end of the day, it's actually ask for. We have to also get public members. So um, the process for, you know, advertising and talking to people and. Yeah. yeah, so the idea is to invite all of the current public okay. members since they're, um, they've, okay. they're serving through July 2025 at this point. So, okay. um, That'd be perfect. yeah. All right. So we have closed session, correct? Um, any public comment on closed session? No? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Guys. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome to the new committee. <laughs> <laughs> the public advisor.